greetings and salutations to everyone following this channel and our new today's study titled New Truths into New People. May this study be a blessing to you. Why are there so many divisions in Christianity and why are there thousands of different church organizations that all say they read the same Bible and are guided by the same God, yet they understand it differently and have different experiences. This practice leads many unbelievers to think that the Bible cannot be understood and it's not worth reading. However, all this work is the work of God's and man's enemy, Satan. Why don't all Christians believe the same if one God teaches them? Why don't they understand God's word equally and speak equally? And yet they all say they have Christ in them and so the mind of Christ. Why are there many arguments, bigotry and divisions among nominal Christians while God teaches them to be of one mind and to even love their enemies? All this is the work of God's and man's enemy, Satan. Apostle Paul writes, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind, and in the same judgment. For it had been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you, now this I say, that every one of you said, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I am of Cephas, and I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were ye baptized in the name of Paul? Is it possible that the vast majority of Christians today are more under the influence of fallen angels than under the guidance of God and of influence of the good angels? Is it possible that only rare individuals have the mind of Christ and that they experienced the new birth of Christ, the second Adam, and became the temple of Christ's spirit? The Holy Scriptures confirm that this is exactly so. And Jesus said, Enter ye are the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. An unbiblical religion consisting of human customs and traditions, and no new birth, is the religion of the majority and is represented in the scriptures as a broad way and a wide gate through which many go. On the other hand, there is a very small number of true followers of God who are born again and who live in accordance to the commandments of God and live from every word that the Lord wrote in the scriptures, and they die to self. They walk the narrow way and pass through the straight gate. God's people at all times represented a small group of newborn believers and a minority in comparison to the rest of the world, and for this reason they are described in scriptures as remnant. The servant of Christ often has to stand alone in front of a large multitude, because he represents God's interests and carries out Christ's commission, which reads, It is written in scripture, or thus said the Lord. Apostle Paul, speaking about this, said, for if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. However, despite the facts, Satan succeeded to spread the idea that popular churches, in which the vast majority of believers are found, and who follow the broad way on which God's commandments are broken, are the ones that are true, while the small remnant that keeps God's commandments and the faith of Jesus is a sect. God has always had a group of believers who represented his remnant. They understood God's will 
and lived according to it, and they understood the truth for their time, because the Spirit of truth guided them into every truth from the Word of God. And we live in a time when this verse is to be fulfilled, and it reads, And the dragon was wrought with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. What is the testimony of Jesus Christ? Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. We also have another translation that says, Worship thou God, for the witnessing of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The true people of God will keep the commandments of God and have the spirit of prophecy or spirit of witnesses within them. What is the way to become God's remnant and to be a people who will understand and live according to the truth? The solution is not I, but Christ in me. A gape love and war in heaven. The first being in heaven to rebel against God's selfless and self-sacrificing love, which is revealed in God's law, was Satan. For him, the idea that love does not glorify itself, does not puff up, does not seek its own, does not get angry, and endures everything, was too limiting. He rebelled against that love, and decided to introduce a new law of self-love. Since his fall, he has not stopped fighting against God's self-sacrifice in love. Since the fall into sin, our natural state is that we are children of wrath and tend to defend and worship our ego. The state of man without Christ is, but the wicked are like the troubled sea, when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, said the Lord, to the wicked. Sin has destroyed our peace. Until the self submits, we cannot find peace. No human power can restrain the passions that rule the heart. We are as helpless here as the disciples in the silence in the raging tempest. How to reach peace and preserve it. As Jesus rested by faith in the care of the Father, so we should rest in the care of our Saviour. If the disciples had trusted him, they would have kept their peace. He who commanded the great waves of Galilee to be still spoke the word of peace to every soul. No matter how fierce the storm, those who turn to Jesus with a cry, Lord, deliver us, will receive liberation. His mercy silences the storm of human passions, and in his love the heart finds peace. And how to reach peace? Romans 5.1 Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And the work of righteousness shall be peace and the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. Christ's presence in us will bring heavenly peace to our soul. Our fickle and unreliable love is the only love we can give and show on our own. That is why Jesus, through the experience of new birth, wants to give us his agape love through his Spirit, so to set us free from worshiping self and to glorify himself through his people. If we want to bridge that lofty ideal, everything that causes the soul to stumble must be sacrificed. Sin uses our will to keep us in its power. The submission of the will is represented in Bible by plucking out an eye or cutting off a hand. It often seems to us that submitting our will to God means agreeing to go through life deformed or lame. But it is better for you, says Christ, to be deformed, wounded and lame if that is how you can enter into life. 
what you consider to be downfall actually leads you to the greater blessing. How can the problem of death be solved and how can an evil man become good? The only and true way is the way of the cross, i.e. rejection of self, also known as denying self or self-denial. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if he die, he bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. Denying self and submitting to Christ is the way to holiness. John the Baptist said for Christ, He must increase, but I must decrease. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. The law of self-serve is the law of self-destruction, and the law of service to others is the law of eternal life. In reference to this, Jesus emphasizes, But so shall it not be among you, but whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister, and whosoever of you will be the chiefest, shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. And Jesus said, But which of you, having a servant ploughing or feeding cattle, will say unto him by and by, when he is come from the field, Go and sit down to me? And will not rather say unto him, Make ready wherewith I may sup, and girl thyself, and serve me, till I have eaten and drunken, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink. Doth he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I throw not. So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all these things which are commanded you, say, We are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. Unprofitable servants means not relying on our works, but allowing Christ to live in us and glorifying Him alone, which is destructive to our ego. This becomes easy if we love Christ more than ourselves. Then we will want to be nothing and Jesus to be our everything. Verses which talk about dying to our desires, feelings and thoughts for the sake of Christ's will and glory. I'm crucified with Christ and this is the crucifixion of our desires, our inner feelings and thoughts. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then were all dead, and that Christ died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them, and rose again. The problem of sin is related to our ego. That is why we need to crucify our ego and die to self in order to be freed from the power of sin. Satan uses our ego to keep us in bondage to sin and to manipulate us. Our ego prevents us from correctly understanding God's word. Because they cannot penetrate its secrets, doubters and unbelievers reject God's word. And many who say they believe the Bible are not free from human interpretations and relying on their own reasoning which the enemy skillfully uses. 
It is correct that we deeply investigate the biblical teachings and examine the deep things of God as far as they are revealed in the Bible. However, Satan seeks to pervert the investigative abilities of the human mind. When studying biblical truths, a kind of pride comes to the fore, because people become impatient and feel defeated if they cannot explain every text of Scripture to their satisfaction. They think that they would be too humbled to admit that they are not capable of penetrating God's Word. They are not prepared to wait patiently until God sees fit to reveal the truth to them. They think that their human wisdom is enough to understand Scripture without God's help. Without the guidance of the Spirit of Christ and relying on their own reason, they call on the enemy to inspire them with various and wrong interpretations in order to lead them away from the saving truth. Numerous theories and doctrines which are considered to arise from the Bible have no foundation in its teaching and are fundamentally opposed to the whole voice of divine inspiration. All these interpretations have caused doubt and confusion in many minds. However, that should not be blamed on the word of God, but man's twisting of the scriptures. Peter writes, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. God's intention is for man to develop his reasoning faculties, and the study of the Bible strengthens and refines the mind better than any other study. However, we must beware of relying on reason, because it is subject to the weaknesses and shortcomings of the human race. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. Proverbs 3, 5. If we do not want the scriptures to be incomprehensible to us, so that we can understand even the clearest truths, we must have the simplicity and faith of a little child and be ready to learn and pray fervently for the help of the Spirit of Christ. The awareness of God's power and wisdom and our inability to comprehend His greatness should inspire us with humility. We should open His word as if we were stepping into His presence with holy awe. When we open the Bible, our reason must acknowledge an authority greater than our own, and heart and mind must bow before the great Creator. Many texts seem difficult and unclear to us, but God will make them clear and understandable for those who try to understand them in this way. However, without the guidance of the Holy Spirit, we will always tend to twist or misinterpret the Scriptures. Often, just the common reading of the Bible does not bring any benefits, but on the contrary causes real harm. When God's word is open without reverence and prayer, when thoughts and feelings are not consecrated to God or are not in accordance with his will, Satan darkens the mind with doubt, and in other cause of studying the Bible, unbelief grows stronger. The enemy takes control of thoughts and suggests interpretations that are not correct. Whenever people do not try to be in harmony with God in word and deed, then regardless of their level of education and level of intelligence, they tend to misunderstand the scriptures and therefore we cannot have confidence in their interpretations. Those who search the scriptures to find contradictions or prove their point of view are not guided by God, and such a distorted view invites the enemy and will lead them to find reason for doubt and unbelief even in that which is quite plain and simple. For the above reasons, today there are many interpretations of the scriptures and there are many different Christian directions. In order to have God's guidance and the mind of Christ, we need to surrender ourselves completely to God to lead us and direct our lives. 
what does complete surrender look like? Matthew left all, rose up and followed him. There was no hesitation, double thoughts, thinking about profitable job that should be replaced by poverty and hardship. It was enough for him that he would be with Jesus, that he would be able to listen to his words and unite with him in his work. When Jesus asked Peter and his companions to follow him, they immediately left their boats and nets. Some of these disciples had household members that they supported, but when they received the Savior's call, they did not hesitate to ask themselves, how will I live and support my family? They were obedient to the call, so when Jesus later asked them, When I sent you without purse and script and shoes, lucky anything, they could say nothing. Matthew in his wealth and Andrew and Peter in their poverty were put before the same temptation. At a moment of success, when the nets were full of fish and the incentives of the old way of life were strongest, Jesus asked them to leave everything for the work of the gospel. Thus every soul is tested whether the desire for transitory goods or the desire for companionship with Christ is stronger. The principle always demands a lot. No man can succeed in the service of God unless his whole heart is in it, and he does not regard everything as a detriment to the prevailing knowledge of Christ. No man who shrinks himself can be a disciple of Christ. When people correctly understand the great salvation, the self-sacrifice that was reflected in Christ's life, it will be revealed in days. Whichever way he leads them, they will rejoice to follow him. New wine into new bottles. New wine, or i.e. new truths from the Lord, go only into new bottles of persons who are newborn of Christ and who die to self and sin more and more each day. How does a spiritual man think? I protest by a rejoicing which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die daily. But I keep under my body and bring it unto subjection, lest that by any means, when I have made preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. The war sins are pride and selfishness, because they are completely contrary to God's nature. We are called to question ourselves, not others. We are called to love others as Jesus loved them, so that his unconditional love and selfless love may be revealed in our selfish lives. While those who submit to the influence of the Holy Spirit begin a battle with self, those who hold fast to sin battle against the truth and its bearers. These six things dot the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. Four, an heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Five, feet that be swift in running to mischief. Six, a false witness that speaketh lies. And seven, he that soweth discord among brethren. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and I have no charity or I have no love, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith and that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burnt, and I have not love, it profited me nothing. Charity suffered long and its kind, charity envieth not, charity vaunteth not itself, it is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. 
charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail, whether there be tongues, they shall cease, whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. With the new birth, we receive this love and become new bottles. And no man put a new wine into old bottles, else the new wine will burst the bottles and be spilled, and the bottles shall perish. But new wine must be put into new bottles, and both are preserved. No man also having drunk old wine straight away desired new, for he said, The old is better. Christ's teaching could not be combined with Pharisees' forms. Christ did not need to close the bridge that was made by John's teaching. He will make the separation between the old and the new even more distinct. Jesus further illustrated this fact, saying, And no man put a new wine into all bottles, else the new wine will burst the bottles and be spilled, and the bottles shall perish. The wine bottles that were used to store new wine after some time became dry and brittle and unfit to serve the same purpose again. With this famous picture, Jesus depicted the condition of the Jewish leaders. Priests, scribes and chiefs were hardened in their routine of ordinances and traditions. Their hearts became constricted, hard and brittle like the dried wine bottles which Jesus used to compare them with. While they remained satisfied with the religion that relied on the law, they could not become guardians of the living heavenly truth. They considered that their justice was quite sufficient and did not want anything new to be introduced into their religion. God's faith, which works with love and purifies the soul, could not find a point of union with the Pharisees' faith made up of ceremonies and human ideas. This is a true picture of Christendom today and the condition of the leaders. They crucify Christ today just as the spiritual authorities did back then. The effort to unite the teachings of Jesus with established religion would be futile. God's truth, same as fermented wine, would destroy the old rotten bottles of church traditions. The priests considered themselves too wise to need instruction, too righteous to need salvation, too reverent to need the reverence that comes from Christ. The Saviour turned from them to find others who would accept the heavenly message. In the uneducated fisherman, in the tax collector in the square, in the Samaritan woman, in the ordinary people who gladly listened to him, he found his new wine bottles for the new wine. It is so today also. The instruments that will be used in the work of preaching are people who would gladly accept the light or truth sent by God. These are his representatives to convey today's truth to this world. If by Christ's grace his people become a new wine bottle by being born again, then he will fill them with new wine, or the present truth for our time. Psalms 51 The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. Man must free himself from the self in order to be a disciple of Jesus. When he denies himself, then the Lord can make a new creation out of a man. Then new wine bottles can hold new wine. Christ's love will inspire a believer with a new life. In the one who looks onto the author and finisher of our faith, the character of Christ will be revealed. Christ's teaching, though represented by the new wine, was not a new teaching, but a revelation of what had been taught from the beginning. However, for priests, God's truth has lost its original meaning and beauty. Christ's teaching was new to them in almost every respect, and it was unrecognized and unconfirmed by the official church. 
Trust ye not in lying words, saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. For ye dorothly amend your ways and your doings. The teachings of the churches prevent people from seeing God's truth. Many believers associate themselves and their experience with God with the church. They will always reject Christ and his teachings unless their church believes or rejects it. Thus the enemy keeps them at a distance from Christ and his saving truth. The Lord said, Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Jesus emphasized the power of false teaching to destroy respect for the truth. No man, said he, also having drunk old wine, straightway desired new, for he said, The old is better. The truth that was given to the world through patriarchs and prophets, shone with new beauty in the words of Christ. However, the priests had no desire for the precious new wine until they are emptied of all traditions, customs, and habits, there is no place in their mind and heart for Christ's teachings. It proved to be a ruin of the Jews, and it will prove to be a ruin of many souls in our time today. Thousands are making the same mistake that the Pharisees, rebuked by Christ, made at the feast at Matthew's. Many reject the truth that comes from the Father of light rather than to reject some cherished idea or renounce some idol in their understanding. They trust in themselves and they rely on their own wisdom without understanding their spiritual poverty. They persistently seek to be saved in some way by which they can accomplish some significant work. When they see that there is no way to weave themselves into that work, they reject the salvation offered. They are ready to exclaim, Where am I and my actions in this whole story? However, God's gospel says, Not I, but Christ liveth in me. Legal religion can never bring souls to Christ because it is faith without love, religion without Christ. Participating in worship, performing church ceremonies, external humility, keeping customs, it all influences the one who does all this to consider himself righteous, destined for heaven and better than others, but this is all a deception. Our own works, driven by our own sinful and selfish ego, can never bring us salvation. A proud heart aspires to merit salvation. But our right to heaven and our eligibility for it is based on the righteousness of Christ. The Lord cannot do anything for the restoration of a man until he, being convinced of his own weakness and being freed from all thought that he is sufficient to himself, submits to God's authority. For thus said the High and the Lofty One, that inhabited eternity, whose name is Holy, I dwell in the high and holy place, with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble, and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. It is not God who blinds people's eyes or hardens their hearts. He sends them light to correct their errors and lead them to the truth. It is only by rejecting the truth or the light that the eyes become blind and the heart hardens. Often this flow is gradual and almost imperceptible. Light reaches the soul through God's word, through his servants or through the direct action of his spirit. But when one ray of light is despised, a partial numbing of the spiritual senses occurs, so that the next revelation of light is much more vaguely recognized. Thus the darkness increases until there is night in the soul. God says, but I think or interpret what he said, is an attitude that will surely lead us astray and it opens the door for the enemy to tempt us and inspire us with his thoughts. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine. 
whether it be a God, or whether I speak of myself. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory, but he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Shall we not say with the psalmist, Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory, for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. May the Lord bless us and help us in this decision. And until our next fellowship, I wish that you grow spiritually, that the Lord be with you, and bless us all equally according to his abundant grace. God bless you. I give unto you that ye love one another. Love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. John 13, 34 and 35 Love one another as I have loved you